Hello, and welcome to a special edition of Listen Toys. Yes, that's right, we've done a special edition of Draw Toys, and now it's time to make an album version of it as well. And, uh, talking about Draw Toys, this is in keeping with the theme of this month, which is... Monkey Madness March! You... Thank Just you. me? Okay. Um, and so today, as well, as you can tell from the thumbnail, it's not even a surprise. I don't know why I'm giving this preamble, but we have chosen, well, uh, I, I, I decided basically that instead of just doing Draw Toys, we could involve Listen Toys in with Monkey Madness March. And what better artist and album to choose for the monkey-themed month of March, that, that's how God created the earth, I think, if I read the Bible correctly, then with Gorillaz' debut album, Gorillaz, oh, self-titled, some people call it, I don't know. And, as always, on Listen Toys and all the other podcasts, I have three guests joining me. We have Dan. Hello. We have Tim. Hello. And we have Tom. Hey. And as with usual, uh, as usual with Listen Toys, we are going to go through the album track by track as we've all gone off and listened to this. Now, unfortunately, this one I didn't warn you guys about. I do apologise. Uh, as in the listeners, I warned you guys about this. Uh, usually we kind of listen to one album and decide on the next one at the end of that episode. <laughs> but because this was a special and I wanted to keep it a surprise, uh, we just did it off. But there will be links in the description below to this album on Spotify and YouTube, just in case for some reason you never listen to this album, or you just want to listen along, uh, you know, listen to a track, pause it, see what we thought, and do it like that. Um, and that's about it, really. So we are going to get into it. Now, Dan, I do believe you said you've done a little bit of research on this album. What would you like to tell us what you found out? Okay, so basically, with um, before we even start with Gorillaz, you we got to go back to the 90s. So basically, yeah, yeah. With So Damon Albarn in Gorillaz was also in Blur, right? And Blur was like one of the biggest Britpop bands in the 90s, right? And you've also got the artist as well, Jamie Hewlett, who is known for Tank Girl. Yep. Now, I don't know much about Tank Girl, but I know it was a big comic series in the 90s. I know yeah, you, it was, you know a bit about it. It was you? pretty big. I've got a few Tank Girl issues. I also backed the Kickstarter for 21st Century Tank Girl, which is a really yep. good comic. I've, I've got my name in the comic at, at the back, you know. So. Nice. But yeah, it, it's, it's, a, there. it's a solid but comic anyway, series. Highly anyway, recommend. anyway, so... Um, but the thing was, um, Damon Albarn and Jamie Hewlett actually met in the in the early nineties when Blur were just starting out in a magazine called Deadline Magazine, and that was the uh, I think Tank Girl featured some comics in that, and and they had like an interview, and he would sketch all the Blur character, um, the band, and but they and then they they were you know and then they became good friends and gradually over time both of them were quite dissatisfied with their career because they got to the point where uh, Blur was so popular that they when when the band would you know do things differently uh, on their music a lot of them they, they basically he Damon Album felt really constricted with the Britpop label that the you know the media portrayed him and he didn't like the um he didn't like being a front man at all really and then you also got jamie hewlett who was actually you know he created tank girl but he was actually thick of drawing tank girl for like hmm. for, for six years and but anyway anyway these the, the both of them were were good friends and they they'd hang around often right and i managed with you know, with my research, I managed to get like uh, they had like an interview for Gorillas back in Q magazine. Do you remember when magazines were a thing? Back in the day. Anyway, and this is a, a direct. Something happened to magazines. <laughs> what? What? I think magazines. Still I mean, exist. I, I think oh, Q no, is still on sale everywhere. Q magazine have gone. Oh, have they? Okay. Yeah. Oh, so, okay. Fair. And um, no, enemy is still going, but the magazine. Anyway. Anyway, so this is a so Jamie Hewlett said. Um, so we'd spent hours watching MTV and wondered why everything on it was so terrible. 
I think Damon was tired of being the front man for Blur, and I was just aghast at how boring most pop groups were when they were interviewed. So he said, let's make up a fake band. Nice. And that, presumably, is where Gorillaz comes into it. Yeah, the, the, they were a kind of a, a strange uh, proto kind of... I mean, in a sense, to bring it back to things we've talked about on Talk Toys before, uh, sort of a proto version of VTubers, in a sense. Oh, yeah, definitely. I think... It paved the way for VTubing. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, well it paved that... Well, I... I... I, well, they paid the way for um, a lot of other like virtual well bands and uh, even like what's that um, artist Poppy because that's yeah. kind of oh, yes. like a con that's a, more of a construct than in a similar vein though anyway but um, it you know it, it generally it paved a way for like all these different influences and fused it together because especially like like the hip hop and pop kind of crossover. Yeah, with Damon Album as well. Uh, like his basically, he he also said that one of his he wanted he really wanted to be in the band The Specials, and he also really ah. wanted to be in the band Massive Attack. And he was like, "Oh, I got an idea. Why don't I merge them both together?" And and now after I hear that, right, you, you're just like, "Yeah, you." It is. It's basically that Specials and Massive Attack put together, and. Um, yeah, you can yeah. definitely see the influence and stuff. It's uh and man, what a what an eclectic amount of influence we have. So, um unless anyone has anything more specific to add uh about Gorillas as a whole, we'll uh head on into their first album. Let's do it. Alright then. So uh just for some context, Gorillas was released uh, in two thousand and one and as it happens, by sheer coincidence, by sheer happy coincidence it was released on the 26th of March, uh, 2001, which is almost to the day 20 years ago, uh, because we are recording this on the 27th of March. And th- this th- this was not planned at all, but when Dan informed me of this, I was like, wow, this we have to do this episode now. This is universally just, like, decided. The um, stars are aligned. So, yeah, and uh, so... Presumably as well, I'm guessing, we, we'll discuss this at the end probably, but I'm guessing all of you were aware of this album kind of growing up because it was, you know, it was around the time we were like hitting, you know, the age of like 9, 10 or whatever and, you know. I mean, it was everywhere. <laughs> yeah, th- yeah, this was on the radio and stuff, you couldn't you couldn't get away from it. I mean, I specifically remember one of my friends uh, when I was younger who wasn't particularly into music and would listen to just very, very generic poppy things. Uh, had this album, I remember being kind of transfixed by the by the cover art, being like, "Wow, this looks really cool." I like the kind of comic aesthetic, and uh... yeah, I I also remember it being big, and this was like, you know, well, I was still in primary school, I think, so mm. I remember it being big amongst kids, and that's really surprising considering like the genre mix it is. Yeah, it, it's something, mm. honestly, listening back to this, I didn't realise, well, I, I kind of realised, because I have listened to this album a few times, but I didn't quite appreciate how um, non-mainstream it actually is, if that makes sense. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. Um, right, okay, well, let, let's dive into this uh, genre-breaking, important album. So, uh, we, it, it consists of 13 tracks, I do believe. Right, sorry, I was I was just informed, actually. I've, I've cut a bit out here. I had 17 tracks, not 13. Never mind me. I don't know why I had 13 in my head. But anyway, uh, yes, so Rehash starts off the album. Uh, so I'll briefly write down what I've got in my notes, and then I'll open the floor. I've described it as a chill start to the album. I really like the acoustic guitar. And it's got a lot of weird layers going on, uh, which is certainly not the only track in the album to do that, but... There's there's a lot to like listen out for on a second and third listen if that makes sense. I yeah I I know with the layered vocals and I quite like the layered vocals and I tell you what and this is gonna be throughout the album. I imagine you've noticed this as well, Rig, being the drummer, but the drums are really nice and punchy. Like yes. The now, really crisp drums. So I, I, I keep bringing this up, and I do feel bad for making these references like all the time. But it also reminds me very much uh, of Port- Portishead, 
because the uh the their drummer is also very like it's a strange technical hip hop if that makes sense so it's trip hop yeah Trim yeah hop. kind of it it's got the it's got the flow and like feel of a hip hop thing but it's it's technical it's precise it's like it, it it comes in hard when it needs to and then just like there's lots of fills and stuff yeah o- honestly uh russ or whoever actually is russ obviously cuz they're a virtual band i think the names are revealed russell now. russell yeah but um but russ is like drumming and stuff on it is incredible like throughout the entire album i i really dig the gorillas for that i think is there like a certain level of um it's not like a live like performance so much as the drums are recorded and I don't know edited. Maybe am I right mm, in saying that? Possibly. I, I, I it, it honestly it does feel to me just like you we've it's a live person jamming to it. Um, you know maybe they lay down like a bass beat. Everyone kind of did. I stuff think it's more the... uh, like a hip hop sample beat or drum beat and just that's what I was thinking. Yeah. yeah. Possibly, it depends. I mean, we we'll see in later tracks. There's definitely one or two that it's definitely live drumming. The, there's oh yeah, for sure. You can tell, but yeah, no, it, it might have been. I, I I don't know if I really Isn't picked it up. Is it a guitar playing in the song? Because it's anyway. There's a lot going on. Yeah, I it's mean, really I don't know like... if it's it's sitar, maybe just um, a slide guitar, like one of those metal things, because you can you can make an acoustic sound quite sitari with the right equipment. Satari is definitely a word. <laughs> Satari. Uh, <laughs> Sounds like an alien. Well, hey, it, it's uh, any Sataris listening out there, let me know in the comments. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but right. no, I think um, Rehash does a really good job of like setting up the album. It's got a nice um, opening. Feel yeah, to it. it's, I think approve. it describes Gorillaz's sound, especially like this album, Gorillaz, anyway, sort of you had to show them one track be like oh that was a bit weird and say like, hey a man talking about hey. uh, talking about a bit weird we are on to the next track in the album five four now out the gate i'm just gonna say this is hands down one of my favorite gorillas tracks um sure. yeah go on uh, and i uh, just uh so a bit of a fun fact as well just to uh set everyone off and see if maybe you guys picked up on it as well so five four to me, and to a lot of people, I presume, feels a bit weird timing-wise, as in, like... Um, and obviously, the, the you'd you'd assume it's just because it's played 5-4, which is five notes to a 4-4 to a four, four beat. Mm. Uh, however, that's not the case, because 5-4 can sound natural. It sounds unnatural because there's five notes to the 4 beat, however, the drums are played 4-4, four, four, which means they're out of sync with the guitar, slightly. Oh. Interesting. Yeah, that's pretty. And that's pretty interesting. It's going to be a case of this album, but they've named the track after something <laughs> that's done in the track. Yes. Yeah. yeah. No. Yeah. Time, basically, it's the time signature for the guitar, but I didn't. I didn't pick up on the four by four four beats. Yeah. Well. So I. I. I looked it up because I. I've I've heard you know songs of different time signatures before, but like five four always str- stuck you know struck me as kind of like a it it is it does sound weird but it sounds weird for a different way and then like I realize because if you listen to it the drums are just a steady four four there's no like oh yeah yeah but the the guitar does that like rush extra note and it mm. yeah it just it just adds to it I I really like it because it's like. It's a bit strange. It's a bit kooky. Yeah, go on, Tom. Sorry. I I was going to say, the album and this track in particular uh, feels like it would be at home in the Jet Set Radio feature soundtrack. Yeah, it's definitely... Yeah, now that you mention it, I can hear that. It's definitely got a bit of, like, techno-punk kind of vibes. Yeah. Well, I was getting, like, uh, blur vibes. Which is strange. Yeah. I mean, (laughs) it would make sense. (laughs) Because I felt like this could could have easily been like a like a B side to like Blue's later albums, but I really like it. I really like this one. Yeah, yeah, it's a good one. Yeah, I liked it. 
Nice. So it, far, so good. It's usually the one I trot out to show how uh, actually deep into the Gorillaz discography I am, because it, it is genuinely mm. one of my favourite Gorillaz tracks. <laughs> um, right, so next up, we slide on into the third song, Tomorrow Never Comes. Nope. Tomorrow comes today. That's the one. Tomorrow comes today. <laughs> <laughs> Quite the opposite. <laughs> so t- tomorrow does actually come, and it's coming today. Uh, but yeah, th- this one was like quite melancholic. I found like the, mm. I and man. So bringing back to Tom's point as well, the bass and the drums for this was really good. Like I've yeah, I've punchy. noted that as well. Very punchy bass. Yeah, mm. exactly what I said there, and. What? I've as well. I think Gorillas is quite unique, uh, especially among its contemporaries, for using a harmonica. Uh, this is one of the tracks that uses a harmonica yes. on the album. Um, well, actually, I, I picked like up it. on that, and the thing I got from that, the kind of harmonica e bit, was that this like foreshadows Clint Eastwood, which I thought was like a really cool thing to do on the album because it's got a lot of the same vibes, but it's kind of more laid back and then mm. it kind of brings you back to it when you listen to Clint Eastwood which I thought was chef's kiss yes love that yeah Ooh. right I'm gonna say this um so the wait it's, it is a, a melodica it was wasn't it I think it's just a harmonica or maybe no, no, a melodica. It, oh yeah it was a melod oh yeah I checked the thing it's definitely ah. a melodica oh, so oh okay I might, might be like what is a melodica and basically it's like a, a you can get these really cheap. What are you blow into? Yeah, so yeah. It's, it's, it's a hum- Yeah, it's a it's and, a long based piano. In a and sense. the thing is, right, this is very of um of the dub reggae genre. Like uh, Damon Al- uh, Albon would often listen to this guy called Augustus Pablo, ah. and he got the inspiration because he would have you would this artist would often use melodicas doing his thing and he, so he incorporated that but yeah when i listened to this song i i generally got right this is sounds like the specials but like a more yeah hip-hop-y yeah. trip-hop-y kind of uh thing and i absolutely love it hmm. yeah really chilled it's a it's a proper solid track and that moves in to the fourth track on the album new genius brackets brother which uh, is is something I again I I really really dig the um, instrument backing of mm. this and so here's here's a theory and this is like a my own theory I, I'm probably completely wrong yeah. there's scratching on vocals in the background of someone saying electricity now this sounds a bit like Dell the funky Homo sapien um, as if he's mm. trying to get through to the gorillas and there's like. The, the, there's a bit of interference, but like he's busting through into like the track, that. and maybe we'll see him later. Maybe. I mean, that makes sense. I, and for the, for the uninitiated, uh, people might be saying, right, who is Del the Funky Homo Sapien? Uh, uh, but <laughs> I can't you finish that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not for a minute, you were just going to call him Del the Homo, <laughs> <laughs> which is someone else that I know who lives down the road. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, no, I mean, um, I mean, we'll 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 talk more about him uh, in a bit. But as a as an artist, like he's like I think he's so central to uh, Gorillas. Like I think he he generally did his part and um, then some. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Um, he he sort of he. Well, I I, t- I see him as an honorary member of Gorillas. I, I think sort of he's not really a yeah. a featuring anymore. He's just a guy who features. Sometimes in their songs, but it's just part of the band, really. Yeah, I agree with you. The one thing I got from from New Genius, I don't know if you guys agree with me, but this one, out of all the rest of the album, feels like it would fit in on a newer Gorillaz album more than the rest. Yeah, yeah, I'm kind of seeing that, yeah. I feel like this is the kind of direction they went in in later albums. Yeah, no, uh... something I've noticed, and we, we'll go through it by tracks, but the ones with brackets on them, because there's a few tracks with a bracket, sort of alternative title, I'm guessing, is what they went with. Um, yeah. They tend to, to me, feel a little bit more experimental or, like, a little bit... Well, not, I don't want to say yeah. rougher, but, like, it feels like these were tracks, the... Lo-fi. 
well, no, kind of like the the rest were album tracks, whereas these were like tracks they liked, and they're like, yeah, we, we may put them in the album, and decided to do so. But like, yeah, I don't know. I, they're I the just... less commercial ones, I find. Like, yeah, they 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 were not the ones that charted. Yeah, basically, yeah. Um, and man, on about songs that charted, uh, unfortunately, it doesn't describe the next track. Uh, Clint Eastwood. Uh, so I don't know if you guys have heard of this track. It's it's quite a, it's it's a, it's a really lesser known uh, Gorillaz gem. <laughs> um, 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 I just want to like into this and say the album version. I think it's an absolute crime that they didn't include the longer intro. And I don't know if you guys have oh, heard that. Like the music film. video. From yeah, from the music video, yeah. I Ah uh, yeah. Do you know, I, I hadn't picked up on that, but now I'm thinking of it, yeah, there is like a full intro they've cut out, yeah. And the intro well, they, is kind of builds fantastic. up the atmosphere, doesn't it? Hmm. Yeah. I don't know. I I think it's because uh, I mean I think they used a clip from Day or Dawn of the dead so it could have been like i don't know legal issues or something i don't I, know i don't well, know I, well i really feel that, like i, I think feel like it does on it because mm. there's a there's a track later on that literally has a movie oh, okay uh, yeah <laughs> yeah i was gonna but, say i feel like they added say, up in join for the music video and i feel like that's why it's not on the album because they kind of just did they it definitely they definitely use the intro when it's live as well. Um, mm. ah. Yeah. Now, so uh, a, a small fun side story, actually. So back in the day, back like when downloading MP3s from the internet was all the rage and everything, I had an MP3 player. Um, I actually downloaded an MP3 of this song before I owned the CD. And the MP3 I got was actually an audio rip of the music video. So... Uh, wow. I, I got the intro, which Classic. is great, but also midway through, you just hear like as like as they're fighting the zombies. <laughs> Visual. So like yeah. it it kind of ruined it a bit. So when I got the album, I was like, oh, finally, I can just hear the instruments. Yes. Finally, someone let you out of your cage. <laughs> <laughs> I take it then Sorry. that it's not actually a harmonica in the song; it's a melodica. Yeah, it's a melodica. Yeah. Uh, that's cool though. I I I assumed it's a harmonica as well. I I just so yeah, that's well well spotted mm. then. I mean, oh, it's a classic, isn't it? Yeah. It's yeah. it's yeah, it's yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's um, um yeah, it it's one of those things that like it almost feels like too easy to say like oh Clint Eastwood is one of their best, but like it it just is. Like th- there's yeah. there's no denying how good a song it is, really. Mm. You can't overstate how common it was to hear this in the early noise. It, yeah, it, it was everywhere. But it was, I don't. Yeah, I was going to say I don't think it actually really got to number one, did it? Um, in the it UK, got close. in the UK, uh, I think it was like number three okay. or four. Four, number four. I che- I, I had a oh. look now. So nice. on the list, it's number four. It was number one in Italy and in Ireland. <laughs> so, so, yeah, it was popular. It was very popular. And you would hear it. 2001, you would hear that constantly, basically. But I will say, fun fact about the music video, right? So so in the music video, the, you know, the, it's important because they introduce the characters, right? Yes. And mm. And I think at the time... Like people were wondering, right? Who, who, who? Are, this band's really good. Who are the actual people? And for a while, they didn't. They were like, "Hmm, this sounds like Damon Albarn." And then they found out, yeah, it was. But the actual music video itself, so it introduces the characters, right? But then it also has, um, which is really cool, is uh, zombie gorillas. Yes. Right? But and it kind of. Is, pays a homage to a couple of things. So it pays a homage to, you know, Romero's Dawn of the Dead series. And, you know, that film kind of, uh, you know, if you look at it one thing, you could see that it represents uh, at the r- rampant consumerism during that in, in the 70s. And and uh, why I bring that up is because, right, if you notice, the gorilla zombies sort of dance 
and they kind of dance. Now, you know, the you can compare it to uh, Michael Jackson's Thriller, right? Mm -hmm. But you can also compare it to, like, the pop bands of the 90s and noughties of the time. And then Noodle comes in and kicks them right in the face. And that's, I think that's a perfect analogy of, like, gorillas. They just, because they, re, as I said earlier, they absolutely hated the sort of the MTV scene and they felt gorillas was there to kick and shake things up. Hmm. So, so without much more to add, I think for Clint Eastwood, uh, I mean, well, the, there's loads more we could add, I'm sure, but uh, let's slide on into man research. Oh, that was a that was a poor choice of words. Uh, man research bracket clapper, which uh, I've got to say, the backing track is possibly one of my favourites of the album. I ah uh, just just like. The wubby machine noises that are going on and stuff. Yeah. Oh, it it's just. Oh yeah, the, I I I just really like it. It just it ticks that box in my mind somewhere. That's just like, yeah, yeah, this is good. I actually, I actually said the vocals in this remind me of um, an artist we just looked at, Griff Rees. Oh, okay. So yeah, I yeah, thought, I thought yeah. Interesting to see that. I can. And, hear uh, that. Just a reminder from last time, he did. Griff Reese was in a Gorillaz album, not this one, but a later one. Yes, Plastic Beach. Yeah, that's yeah. Uh, which we may get onto eventually at some point. Depends how long Listen Toys goes on, or how long YouTube is alive for, or how long we're alive for. Yes. Uh, <laughs> anything else to I add? Know why. On my it reminded me of uh, Splatoon. I know Splatoon was like yeah, kind of years years <laughs> ahead, but I. I was like, I was listening to this and thought, yeah, I, I, it sounds like me rolling paint around the well, area. Uh, so I, I added a small note at the at the bottom with cyberpunk question mark, which is like, it gives me a mildly cyberpunk vibe, if that makes sense, of like, strange mix of like kind of lo-fi uh, instruments and like electronic wubby noises. Yeah, and, wubby. Uh, and man, gorillas quite enjoy experimenting with noises, as they did in the next track, Punk. Now, th this is a really deep one. Um, I don't know why they named the song this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so much like 5-4, uh, I feel like they were like, what do we call this punky one? Punk. No, yeah, what do we call it? Punk. <laughs> right, okay, yeah, we'll call it Punk. <laughs> But it's it's a it's, really it's a really fun song. They they were just mucking about clearly. Yeah, and honestly, like it is, they basically put a punk song to a T. It's short, hmm. like punk songs 54, are. I think. Yeah, it was really short and snappy. You know, it uh, it really shows how eclectic uh, they can be. And I know I've said that with a few artists now, but Gorillas are definitely one of those artists. Uh, quite eclectic. Yeah, this is a track I forget exists, to be honest, until I re-listened to this album, like, the last two weeks. I was like, oh, shit, yeah, they did that, like, weird punky song. Yeah. So, we are then on to the third bracket song, and that is Soundcheck, bracket, Gravity, uh, which I feel like this did quite well. I don't think it was released as a single, but I've heard this around, like, different places, I swear. Hmm. Um, I was... I don't know. Maybe. I don't know if they put it as a single. No, I, I, oh, maybe like, uh, I, I feel like maybe it featured on the soundtrack to something once or something, because this feels like one of those ones I've heard quite a few times, but like not specifically by listening to the album. I, I don't know. Well, maybe I'm getting it confused or something else, but, uh, mm -hmm. but yeah, yeah, no, I quite like this one. It's got scratchy, scratched vocals again. Um, Mm. Which I I can't work out what the guy is saying. Uh, it sounds like he's saying something fucking crazy, but I I could be wrong. I feel Maybe. like uh, the vocals. Um, it's got like a hip hop kind of backtrack, but the vocals aren't, and mm. it's good. I I like it. I like it. I'm actually said on this one, big fan of the backing track. So yes, yeah, yeah. Same. Uh, th there was also there's some strings as well, like violins and stuff in this one, which I really Yes, dug. yeah, there was violins. They do well. get quite orchestral at times, don't they, Gorillaz? Mm. I like that about them. Yeah, I, I think this is the first time we see 
a stringed instrument? Well, no, apart from a guitar, obviously, and a bass. Man, talking about a bass, next up, we've got... Oh, two of them. Two of them, <laughs> double bass, uh, which oh, is a contender for one of my favourite tracks on the album. <laughs> what instrument do they use in this track? Hmm. Pretty sure it's a melodic. <laughs> <laughs> so so this one actually Dan brought up Splatoon earlier another part of my notes is Splatoon question mark because this genuinely sounds like if you'd put her in a Splatoon level I don't think like the single player stuff which tends to be a bit more low key I don't think it would feel out of place at all no I, I'm totally with you there I well I was just getting thing. I don't know why I was getting Mad Max a pop apocalyptic vibes of just like like driving around a, a desert and nothing's happening they're just driving along the desert and that's but I, I do yeah yeah that's the thing you know I love this one mm. uh like I I often kind of went back to it a lot just just to listen to it on its own I and even though it's on a loop it's it's like oh you know it, it, I I just want to listen to it again and again and then and then he he says something. Um, oh, I, all, all together, it makes me feel very very nervous, and there, or something like oh, that. Oh yeah. yeah, there's just like a random. Bri- it feels like he's reading a bit of poetry, but it's sort of. I, I'm guessing it's just a lyric, though. So. Good. I think part of why this one is so like um, you want to come back and listen to it so much is because it's kind of unstructured. It kind mm. of just kind of like you said, it kind of it loops, but then they do so much like stuff over it and it doesn't really have any set and form it's just like oh yeah yeah i find it. it's it's very there's a lot going on but it's very like i don't say low key but it's basically um like if you think of the album structure it's very much this is the break and it's nothing yeah. too crazy yeah. mm. uh because basically you know this is the kind of the downtime and and then it hits uh, with rock the house after I've I've yeah. got a lot of respect as well for just bass being a central thing on any on any song. It's like oh yeah, because it's literally yeah. the backing instrument. Underused. Yeah, it's it's just oh, it's really good. Uh, and as Dan mentioned, we slide on in to rock the house, which is another um, Dell song. I love uh, this one. Pretty well. Yeah. To be honest, this is a Del the Funky Homo Sapiens song featuring gorillas. Even I'd say. <laughs> I um, <laughs> I said a little no on this. Uh, the trumpet in it feels like it's gonna like pan to an audience on a British game show as it comes, <laughs> 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 like at the start See, of a British game show. I thought it reminded me of like the start of a Quentin Tarantino movie, which is like a slide at the start of the movie. That's the vibe I got from it. But yeah, now that you mention it, I can see what you mean. I think that was also, actually a sample, but I nonetheless, oh, it is, it is, I it. absolutely, I absolutely yeah. love it. Like I think well, that's the thing. Um, samples when it's used right. Oh, and I, that's the thing. I was getting Tarantino vibes about this as well. Like, or even like. Um, a Guy Ritchie film. Yeah. Mm, yeah. I think this would work in a Guy Ritchie film, you know. <laughs> it's a four ton truck, Tyro. It's it's yeah, it's it's quite it is very gorillas as well. It's sort of like it well, I mean, as Thomas said, they're so eclectic and stuff that it fits as their kind of like th- this is basically uh in my head canon what like what people in the gorillas world would listen to at like a house party or something. Mm. Am sense. I am I right in saying uh, that there's a recorder in this song or some sort of thing? Oh, like oh, a recorder. yes, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> the um, yeah, like a flute or something that sounds like it's played by someone who's not had the best amount of practice with it. Well, that's why I thought it was a recorder because recorders never sound that good and yeah. it sounded like a recorder and it's probably yeah. like the first time I've seen the serious use of a recorder <laughs> in a song yeah that's true that's uh, yeah, yeah it, it's, it definitely stands out but like it fits that off kilter feel of gorillas where it's like even things that are like played weirdly or whatever is like yeah, that fits. That it it just works because like 
Mm. Yeah, Rock the House is definitely one of my one of my standouts from the album. Yeah, and uh, and you know what else works? Nineteen two thousand, uh, which is it's another really right. low key I'm coming song. Straight in on this one because nineteen two thousand is one of my favorite songs of all time. I absolutely love nineteen two thousand. I know it's probably like a normie choice for like favorite gorilla song. <laughs> it is good. But it is, it is a good this part. song. Yeah, it, it this song is. Like the years, like early noise to me. It just it literally takes me back as soon as I listen to it. Yes, it's no. you... so good. It's funny because I could. I've obviously heard this song a lot, but I didn't know who it was by. Yet, nor did I know the name of the track. So I guess when I so. heard it on this, really? I was like, oh, it's that, is it? Oh, okay. Um, so. But I, yeah, great track. I've uh, yeah. So going with what Tim said as well, this gives me listening to this again gives me very very strong sort of like two thousand one two thousand two vibes of like as a kid, especially like absolutely the the line that Noodle sings the 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 chorus bit of the choo shun mm. is like stuck yeah. in my head. It, it it's just a line that will like come up idly when I'm just like not thinking of anything I'll be like why why is that still engraved in my brain interesting because I have that with um, the line where he goes aren't gorillas in a happy mood I like literally I will be lying in bed trying to get to sleep and that will just suddenly <laughs> pop into my mind so it's so something I didn't realize as well so listening to it on quite good headphones and stuff and quite loud in the background I didn't realize that Noodle had her own vocal bit, you know, like during the sort of during the chorus and the verses and stuff. You can hear her kind of singing the yeah. melody, and I never picked up on this. Yeah. And for years, I was like, "Oh, yo, that's really cool." So she's like throughout the song. It's not just the the chorus. It's it's really nice. So I just got a, a fun fact as well. So Tina Weymouth from Talking Heads and Tom Tom Club. Mm-hmm. Uh, is uh, she does the vocals on the on the track, not the main one, oh, uh, okay. the no- by noodle, but hmm. uh, she does the a uh, in the background and stuff. So it's ah, just we- like ah. what's the thing? You, you, it's 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 odd because you know you once you uh, dive deep into it, you can see how much work has been made, you know, into yeah. making these songs. I mean. And- Mm. It's a joy. I, I think the thing that defines Gorillas really is that, like, clearly they recorded like twelve different tracks and like layered them. Sort of the this isn't a kind of it's not a a typical kind of band setup. It, it's a lot more akin to like hip hop producing, basically, which is sort of yeah. like yeah. getting the vocals is like almost a minor thing because like you've got you've got the backing track, but the backing track isn't one track. It's like five tracks basically I um it's really interesting I, you said that about um Tom Tom Club Dad because I get a big Genius of Love vibe from this track very much mm. Mm. I didn't realise but Noodle I didn't know Noodle was voiced by so I just had a quick search and Noodle's been voiced by I think four different people oh wow okay oh. that's, that's yeah. interesting Noodle is also very cute oh yeah right talking about cute I, I've got to work on these segues. <laughs> Let's go in to Latin Simone, Que Pasa Contigo, uh, which I'm going to say, if I had to choose, it's probably my least favourite track on the album. I don't I don't dislike the track, but it it, it does nothing for me, basically. This is I have little... to disagree. Oh, I know. This I... Is... Yeah, yeah, this is yeah. Yeah. up there in mine. Yeah, I like it. It's, um, I found out it was sung by a Afro-Cuban singer called Ibrahim Ferrer. Ah. Mm. Yeah. Lots of thing. I think, like, this track, I think uh, on my initial listen, I, I was kind of like, oh, you know, I'm not not as digging it as much as Rock the House or 19-2000, but, like, as you have a couple of listens of it, you, I find myself really enjoying all these sort of different musicians from across the world, and I think that's, hmm. I think that's the, the beauty of Gorillaz, as as a band is that they're because they have so many things going on they can and they have so many guests that they they kind of 
add this model to to you know they double down on this kind of feature on yeah. their next albums but it's kind of like here is where they're kind of starting out and then you know after the success of this album it's like hey let's yeah let's, let's just get more <clears throat> special guests on you and and it's great as well because yeah. you're you, you're being introduced to new new styles that you probably wouldn't hear in top forty um, songs. Yeah. So that's that's yeah. why I kind of like it. I think this is, it's a it's a slow burn, but uh, now I do like Latin Simone. Hmm. So yeah. yeah, I mean, I I don't dislike it. I think it's just that like the the genre is kind of samples or features or whatever. It's sort of like because I don't really. I can't say I'm sort of particularly into it. It's just, just kind of like a. It's all right. It's uh, it, it's it's a nice feature, basically. It's the way I say it. And so we move into uh, the kind of d- downward d- downward path now to the end of the uh, the album. I feel like this this is more of a come down kind of thing, and that is Starshine, which uh, I I kind of I struggle to write many notes on this one. It's yeah. It didn't really stand this out. This is the worst. Yeah, what you said about Latin Simone. This is how I feel about this one. It's like, yeah, I don't, I don't yeah. It, but it's definitely like a. Eh, eh. It's mm. definitely the weakest track of the album for me. I think it's very. Um, I think it's kind of like a bit bare bones, and this, you know, it's a very like like almost like a. Um, you know, you you he's, he's, you know they're fiddling around about with a track, trying to figure out, and then they're just like, oh, we'll just put it out. Uh, and I mean, it's not like they haven't done anything to it, you know. But I find you're listening to it, like the guitar line is a uh, uh, bit, hmm. I don't know, not too exciting I... for me. It does, it's very like it is kind of dropping down a bit, and yeah, uh, you know, uh, to sig- like as you said, to signify the end of an album. But I just felt like after Latin Simone, it just yeah I'm, I'm so glad I, I, to... I didn't like this one that much I'm glad to hear that you guys kind of felt the same because I, I genuinely as I was writing notes for this I was like am I like um... have I listened too much <laughs> to the album am I like burnt out or something and I was like uh, but... am I wrong <laughs> no it's the kids that are wrong <laughs> <laughs> but, but on the kind of other end is the next track Slow Country um, which for me Whilst I think Clint Eastwood is the best track on the album, Slow Country has really, really grown on me. Um, I remember not massively digging it years ago, but it's it's, it's kind of weird. It's got a lot going on. And also, right, I don't know about you guys, maybe I'm wrong here. In the background, it sounds like they've sampled a football chant at a football game. I wasn't a fan of that. I I think it was a chant as well. But... Right, okay, yeah. I thought it was harsh noise. Well, it so was a bit too harsh I, for me. I couldn't I tell, right, if it was wind, as in a... Or if it uh, was... That's what I got from it. I got, like, wind. I got a chanting. Yeah, it, it felt like, if you you know, at the football stadium, when, like, they all start, you know, like, thousands of people start chanting or whatever, like, it's got that weird ethereal roar to it, because, like, it all echoes and stuff, and, like... I, I'm assuming it's a football chant because I mean Demon's British and stuff, but it might be wind. I don't know, but, but yeah, or I don't know. Like, Slow uh, country, like solid. You know, synthesizers and this just like because you can make synthesizers yeah. to the point where it sounds yeah. like like this sort of harsh noise. So mm. yeah. Yeah, sl- slow country. You said me. about it growing on you, though, Rid, because I had the exact same thing when I was listening to it. I was like, I used to, uh, when I was little, I'd skip Starshine in this one. But when I listened to it again, I was like, oh, actually, you know, this one's actually got some cool bits. Yeah, it's, it's uh, uh... I like the tempo of it, I think, as well. It it, mm. it feels a bit reggae in, in parts. Mm. Yeah. I can see this as, like, if you take away the vocals, not that it's bad or anything, but... Like I mean, you could say this for a lot of the albums. They all sound like a lo-fi, like playlist that you've put on in the background. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I don't know. I thought this track was was okay, but I I think like with most things, they do kind of grow on you. Um, yeah. But mm. uh, I wouldn't say it's the strongest track on the album. But you know, I I you know it it, it wasn't too bad. It, I'd say it was it meh for me. I think Starshine mm. was the Lowest of the low, but anyway, right. Uh, well, um, oh, sorry, Tom. Oh, yeah, I was gonna say, uh, 
I I was looking up trying to find out what it was that noise. I couldn't find that out, but apparently the track samples Ghost Town by the Specials. Oh, oh. it probably is Wind then, I imagine. So yeah. just the I think yeah, I think maybe I was looking too much into it, but it it, it struck me as a very like lo fi version of the um Pokemon uh, stadium uh, song from Sword and Shield with like the chanting. <laughs> yeah, maybe, yeah. Maybe it's just me. Um Right, so we now come into technically the album closer. We you know, we'll get into more in the next two tracks, but I view this obviously as the the end of the album. And that is M one A one, which I think is the name of two uh two motorways in in Britain. Uh, no, this is the one that I was like blue. This is just blue. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> this is straight up blue. So this track it samples is it Dawn of the Dead, Dan? Or Day of, Day of the, the Dead? Dead? Yeah. Shaun of the Dead. Ah, <laughs> Day of the uh, Dead is Day of the Dead, yeah. Now so this one, this Man, th- this really like tickled something in my brain because this does the thing I love what when bands do, which is like it's a slow start and then it builds and then it's basically just two minutes of the band going mental, just like letting go, yeah. doing what they want, like a boost of energy and uh, mm. going back to the drum things, which I've loved throughout the album. The drumming in this is really solid. There's no like crazy fills or anything, but. Yeah, just the like the this change in tempo. Oh, so good! It's the, it's I, is actually genuine drumming, not um, you know, like drum programming. Yeah, this this is live can... for sure, I, and it's um, a nice closer. Yeah, I was I was gonna say with this, I heard there was a remastered version. Oh, um, I love this song. Apart from the fact, I think the sampling of the Day of the Dead scene was a little bit choppy. As in, kind of. it didn't feel like it cut correctly. Oh, uh, I um, get you, yeah. As if, like, they, they've just t- taken, like, the needle off the vinyl. It's like, right, okay, let's add the song. Yeah, yeah, but I heard, I don't know if the remastered version, like, fixes that. Ah. But uh, the second half, though, bloody hell. I, really good. I do remember, yeah. uh, when I was younger... It, the intro did used to grate on me a lot more than it does now because I remember being like, oh, you've sampled the th- same part three times, yeah, we know, then there's the pitch of, hello. I was like, yeah, so now get on with it. But like, no, I don't know, it's it just, it's atmosphere of building, I'm, I'm fine with it. So I've, I've grown as a person, I think. Uh, Ryan, talking about growing as a person... Uh, we have the first of the two bonus tracks with this album. Now, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty confident in saying, these bonus tracks featured on the regular album. I don't think an album exists without these, but I could be wrong. Let me know in the comments below. I think this was a uh, uh, UK edition. Ah, I see, okay. That which is quite unique because... Um, so if, because I I, I I didn't bother listening to these at first. Uh, oh, hang on. Let, I, I'll, I'll introduce them first, then we'll, we'll go into it. Sorry, j- just so I can have something on the screen. So the first of the two bonus tracks is Clint Eastwood, which is the Ed Case Sweetie Irie refix. Refix, not remix. Sorry, Dan, continue. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's fine. So, yeah, yeah, I, no, I listened to this, and it's, and it's basically a kind of like a garage take on Clint Eastwood, and hmm. so they would... This was actually uh, um, this actually charted as well, and oh. because it would be played in a lot of like underground clubs and raves. Ah, this that's... is what the um, popular kids on the on the playground used to have. You know, the regular kids would have the normal version, but the popular kids they'd have the cool garage version. I so... distinctly totally remember that. So my my notes for this, uh, basically, I, I've I've just put two uh, two words and I'll extrapolate on it, which is love hate, which is I love the the like reggae dub approach here and the like garage thing of you know like speeding it up a bit and like the vocals and the thing really like that. Mm. The chorus I cannot stand. It is it's out of time and out of key. If that makes sense, like the yeah, it. I agree. I think I. I mean, it's it's a little bit jarring, but it's like I think I can imagine being in a club listening to this, and it'd be kind of yeah, like it I, like in a setting it would be okay. But I feel like I I I look at it and think, oh, 
what have they done to my boy? It, well, it's 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 almost you know. really really it good. good. It is good. Apart from that chorus, like it, it just bothers me. And I'm you know maybe I'm looking at this too tight, but like it just feels like he's missed it by a second. But then he's going. But like the thing that slightly bothers me is at the end of the chorus, you hear him going like na 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 na, as if like. I've got to pad it out a bit, and it's like come in earlier, come in earlier, and he wouldn't pad anything out. It's fine, but I, I don't know. It's, <laughs> it's just it's something that's always bothered me about this remix. I love ninety percent of it, but like just oh, fix the chorus, basically. I, I don't but know. I like how saying that I like how gr- gorillas were like, hey, let's have these different remixes of mm. our songs mm. and do something to it because as yeah. you, you got to think as well because. Damon, Damon album, 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 album. <laughs> album. Damon. Uh, yeah, he, I think he, he, I think he's one of those guys that generally loves different kinds of music, and I think he's at this time he's trying to break out of the Brit pop mold by, yeah, and he's got sense. his like, he's got his fingers in you know different genres and even like, hey, why not? Let's let's do a guard, uh, you know, let yeah. someone do a reef refix yeah it, I, I i appreciate it. it it's one of those things that like despite my own feelings on the track i i prefer that it exists than it doesn't exist if that makes sense I, like so i really liked it um i don't i don't know if i noticed that criticism myself because i've also i've definitely heard this before i've listened to it a lot before this remix yeah. Um, I think it's a complete transformation of the song, and it's very creative what's mm. been done with this remix, I think, because um, it completely changes what the song is, I think. Right, well, that that moves us into the very final song and the uh, second remix of the album, which is 192000 Soul Child Remix. Um, and this, so I, I probably uh, speaking for you guys as well here, but this is the version I think I heard the most because this got a lot of radio play, I feel like. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I remember this one being played quite a lot. Yeah, I, I think so, yeah. It did. Written, I'm, uh, I'm the only one out here. I, I only have heard the 192,000. Oh, okay. So, well, yeah. th- so the thing is, I will be honest, listening to this, I was like, Hang on, wait. What have they even changed? So, like, I I have had to listen to both of them back to back because whilst the Clint Eastwood remix was completely different, like, it, it, yeah, this one basically kind of felt like they added a few. Basically, it feels more more produced, if that makes sense. As if like, yeah, they took it and because like, because basically, in my mind, when I listen to Basic nineteen two thousand. There's that vocal near the end of the Soul Child remix, which is like something like, come on, let's break this down. And then like it goes back into it. And that to me is just part of the song. So clearly like the Soul Child <laughs> remix is what yeah. I listened to the most as a kid, I guess, so like growing up. I don't know if it's just me, but this remix reminds me of the Futurama opening song. Uh, yeah. Every time I hear it, every time I hear it, I'm like, oh, it's Futurama. No, 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 wait, this is I mean, it was of its, you know, era, so I guess you could you could see that, yeah. If yeah. you want to pin it to something, uh, I I was curious about it. Apparently, it was like featured in a bit of media, but uh, famously, it was the main menu theme in FIFA two thousand and two. Wow! Uh, <laughs> that's probably why I remember it so much. Then, so also probably why I got traction talking about a uh, feature as well so for for a while i um despite the fact i owned the album and stuff uh kind of like tom i forgot the name of 192000 like i i i knew it was by gorillas and what album is on but like i just always forget the track but i specifically remember in cloverfield uh because i usually watch movies with the subtitles on because uh, i'm weird uh, I specifically remember in the house party they're having at the start, the like caption bracket, 192,000 Soul Child remix plays. And I was like, what the <laughs> fuck is that? Why, why are you being so specific? Who the fuck knows what song that is? And I googled it. I was like, no, everyone knows what that song that is. I'm just the idiot here. Sorry. Continue, Cloverfield. 
Right, well, I think that wraps up the album then. Now, we're on to a very important stage of this episode. It's time for the overall scores. Now, I don't know if you guys have prepared a score. If not, I'll leave you, you know, have a think of it for a minute or two. I've, I've, I, I know, I know my score. I would easily give this song a 9 out of 10. Okay. This song, this whole album. <laughs> yeah, it's a 9 out of 10 for me. I mean, the only real down bit is Starshine. The rest of it is just... I, I, know, I know it sounds kind of maybe like over dramatic, but it's kind of groundbreaking <laughs> what they did on this album. And like I said, 2000 is in my top 10 songs of all time. So yeah, it easily gets a 9, 9 out of 10. Nice. I um, So I am going to give it an 8 out of 10. Uh, I, 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 definitely, I definitely place this higher. Now, not to make another thing, uh, so like reference or, you know, thing that we'll follow up in the future, but whilst I really, really like this album, I feel like, unfortunately, I kind of discovered, I properly listened to this the same time roughly as Demon Days. So I think, and it, I think it's purely on my own thing, I can't quite rate it as highly as Demon Days. Uh, so, but, you know, I, I think I think 8 or 10 is a, is a solid score. There's like... There's enough tracks that are amazing, and there's one or two that are like, yeah, these are okay. Like Latin Simone, I felt was like, eh, it's fine. Starshine and the Ed Case remix, I think, kind of bring it down just a tad. But you know, eight, eight or ten. They, they were, to be fair, those were just like bonus tracks for, but well, the the Ed Case one was Starshine and Latin yeah. Simone are just part. Of the oh album. yeah, the Ed Case one and sort of yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, Dan, what would you give it out of ten? Yeah, I mean, do you know what? Um, I'm feeling a. I'm. I'm gonna put it down as a. Oh, the thing is, I was gonna put it down a nine, but I feel like Starshine really. I. I. I that's the thing. Starshine is one of those tracks where I could just, kind of. I mean, it's just about listenable. It's a skip and track. I, it's a strip. It is generally one of those skip tracks, and, and I. Um, so I would have put it down as a nine, but I feel I'm going to put it down as an eight. All right. I think uh, I generally think it's a it's an almost perfect album, but um, I think Starshine kind of let it down a bit. But all the other tracks I really really love. Right, Tom. What is your opinion? So I agree with you uh, on the fact that it's a great album. But I feel in my mind it's overshadowed by Demon Days. Hmm. Um, but but uh, but it is a fantastic album, and having listened to all of it now, probably for the first time, I loved it. I'm going to give it an eight, though. I'm going to agree with you and give it an eight. I think um, I don't think I'm going to rate it down for one song. Hmm. Uh, but uh, yeah, great album. I think. Right. Well, that uh, man. This I think is the highest rated album on in Listen Toys history out of three albums we've done. Yeah, uh, which is understandable <laughs> because, admittedly, whilst the other albums we kind of chose as for discovery purposes, you know, as much as anything else. Yeah. This I I did I feel a little bit cheap, like you know, reviewing a highly you know highly acclaimed album, but. Also, you know, it's it's worth it, I think, and um, it, it's going to be hard to beat, but it fully deserves the uh, the like high score it has. So I'm going to try and keep a um, a database as well about all our scores, just so we can check in future. Uh, and so, talking of, <laughs> talking of something <laughs> I'm also keeping up, it's now time for the certified banger. So <laughs> this is the part of the episode where. I have created a Spotify playlist. However, it's very exclusive. Each of us can nominate up to two songs. And if 75% of us, so that's three out of four, people agree that it's a certified banger, it will go in the official certified banger playlist. Oh, this is going to be tough. So, uh, have a think, guys, obviously, you know, and come back with your two nominations. So what we're going to do is each of us are going to nominate without any discussion, just claim your two nominated songs and then we'll work out in the end if anyone gets through. So for me I'm going to nominate first uh, because I know my two already 
And that is Clint Eastwood and Slow Country. Tim, what are your two? I'm nominating Clint Eastwood and 19-2000. Nice. Tom, what are your two? I'm going to be boring as well. Uh, they're great for a reason. Clint Eastwood and 19-2000. And Dan, what are your two? Okay, I'm going to... I'm gonna claim nineteen two thousand, and right. I, I was gonna say rock the house, but do you know what? I really love Clint Eastwood. <laughs> so, okay, well, yeah. Yeah. so that... it's, it's boring option, but it's it's right. It's correct. Yeah, there you go. I mean, it, it, seems, there's there's no right. wrong choices, and to be <laughs> fair. I, I think we're fairly safe in saying that both Clint Eastwood and 192000 are certified bangers. And I think not just for us, but for music in general. I, I think, as, you, as you've all said, there is a Absolutely. reason they still get airplay today. If they come on the radio, like people are still happy to hear it and stuff. And I think that's it's for a reason. They're both incredibly well-made tracks. Um, I was going to go with 192000, but... Slow Country grew on me just so much that it's a track I'd prefer to put on above 192,000 by a small amount. But right, wow, that makes four songs in our certified banger playlist. Truly, we are yeah. on to something. It's going to build. And it's also, massive. we're on to the end of the episode. Uh, thank you guys very much for joining me. Uh, in discussing the first of the Gorillaz albums. You know, I wouldn't mind, maybe, we could come back and revisit the rest of their discography over the next couple months or years, if I remember to do so. I think Demon Days would be... Yeah, uh, that, that'll be... A... Next March. <laughs> hey, well, there we are. Madness, well, that's the thing. I listened, because I basically, after listening to Gorillaz a couple of times, I was like, oh, I'll listen to... A little bit of Demon Days, why not? And yeah, it's just. I mean, I, I mean, I mean we'll, we'll, we'll get into it in the next episode, Dan, because uh, th- there's a there's a lot to discuss yeah. with Demon Days. Uh, we could even do an entire Listen Toys episode on it. Right. So, thank you very much for watching. Uh, this has been a fun little uh, special. So, next Listen Toys coming up is the album that Ch- Tim chose. Unfortunately. Due to scheduling conflicts and Monkey Madness March, we've kind of had to put her on the back burner for a while. But that will be coming out shortly. Uh, And we'll continue a regular Listen Toys kind of thing. Obviously, I'm not going to ask any of you to nominate an album this time because this is a one-off special. But yeah, that about wraps it up. I'll be leaving a link to the playlist of Listen Toys uh, just in case you missed our previous episodes. And, you know, we'll be making more in the future. So if you do want to you know, subscribe or something if you're enjoying this. That would be very much appreciated. And in the comment section below, let me know what your overall rating for this album is. I'd be very surprised if anyone comments anything below like a 7 or a 10. But hey, you never know. It's discussion makes the world go round. So right, thank you all for joining me, both the people on this and listening. And until next time, goodbye! (laughs)